Wintry winds and rains were sweeping over the English tents on the banks of the Marne, where Henry V was besieging Mull, then the stronghold of one of those terrible freebooters who were always the offspring of a lengthened war. Jean de Gast, usually known as the Bastard de Voris, nominally was of the Armagnac or Patriotic Party, but, in fact, pillaged indiscriminately, especially capturing travelers on their way to Paris, and setting on their heads a heavy price, failing which he hung them upon the great elm tree in the marketplace. The very suburbs of Paris were infested by the forays of this desperate routier, as such highway robbers were called, the supplies of provisions were cut off, and the citizens had petitioned King Henry that he would relieve them from so intolerable an enemy. The king intended to spend the winter months with his queen in England, and at once attacked the place in October, hoping to carry it by a coup de main. He took the lower city, containing the marketplace and several large convents, with no great difficulty, but the upper city, on a rising ground above the river, was strongly fortified, well victualled, and bravely defended, and he found himself forced to invest it, and make a regular siege, though at the expense of severe toil and much sickness and suffering. Both his own prestige in France and the welfare of the capital depended on his success, and he had therefore fixed himself before Mo to take it at whatever cost. The greater part of the army were here encamped, together with the chief nobles, March, Somerset, Salisbury, Warwick, and likewise the King of Scots. James had for a time had the command of the army which besieged and took Drew while Henry was elsewhere engaged, but in general he acted as a sort of volunteer aide de camp to his brother King, and Malcolm Stewart of Gleniski was always with him as his squire. A great change had come over Malcolm in these last few months. His feeble, sickly boyhood seemed to have been entirely cast off, and the warm genial summer sun of France to have strengthened his frame and developed his powers. He had shot up suddenly to a fair height, had almost lost his lameness, and gained much more appearance of health and power of enduring fatigue. His nerves had become less painfully sensitive, and when after his first skirmish, during which he had kept close to King James, far too much terrified to stir an inch from him, he had not only found himself perfectly safe, but had been much praised for his valor, he had been so much pleased with himself that he quite wished for another occasion of displaying his bravery, and, what with use, and what with the increasing spirit of pugnacity, he was as sincere as Ralph Percy in abusing the French. For never coming to a pitched battle. Perhaps, indeed, Malcolm spoke even more eagerly than Ralph, in his own surprise and gratification at finding himself no coward, and his fear lest Percy should detect that he ever had been supposed to be such. So far the King of Scots had succeeded in awakening martial fire in the boy but he found him less the companion in other matters than he had intended. When at Paris, James would have taken him to explore the learned hordes of the already venerable University of Paris, where young James Kennedy, son to Sir James Kennedy of Duna, and to Mary, an elder sister of the king, was studying with exceeding zeal. Both James and Dr. Bennett were greatly interested in this famous abode of hearing, the king, indeed, was already sketching out designs in his own mind for a similar institution in Scotland, designs that were destined to be carried out after his death by Kennedy, and Malcolm perforce heard many inquiries and replies, but he held aloof from friendship with his clerkly cousin Kennedy, and closed his ears as much as might be, hanging back as if afraid of returning to his books. There was in this some real dread of Ralph Percy's mockery of his clerkliness, but there was more real distaste for all that appertained to the past days that he now despised. The tide of vitality and physical vigor, so long deficient, had, whom it had fairly set in, carried him away with it, and in the activity of body newly acquired, mental activity had well nigh ceased. And therewith went much of the tenderness of conscience and devout habits of old. They dropped from him, sometimes for lack of time, sometimes from false shame, and by and by from very weariness and distaste. He was soldier now, and not monk I and even the observances that such soldiers as Henry and James never failed in, and always enforced, were becoming a burthen to him. They wakened misgivings that he did not like, and that must wait till his next general shrift. And as Claremont? Out of her sight, Malcolm dreamed a good deal about her, but more as the woman, less as the saint, and the hopes, so low in her presence, burnt brighter in her absence as Malcolm grew in self-confidence and in knowledge of the world. He knew that when he parted with her he had been a miserable little wretch whom any woman would despise, 
yet she had shown him a sort of preference, how would it be when he returned to her, perhaps a knight, certainly a brave man like other men? Of Patrick Drummond he had as yet heard nothing, and only believed him to be among the Scots who fought on the French side under the earls of Buchan and Douglas. Indeed, James especially avoided places where he knew these Scots to be engaged, as Henry persisted in regarding them as rebels against him, and in hanging all who were made prisoners, nor had Malcolm, during the courtesies that always pass between the outposts of civilized armies, made much attempt to have any communication with his cousin, for though his own abnegation of his rights had never been permitted by his guardian, or reckoned on by his sister or her lover, still he had been so much in earnest about it himself, as, while regarding it as a childish folly, to feel ill at ease in the remembrance, and, though defiant, willing to avoid all that could recall it. Meantime he, with his king, was lodged in a large old convent, as part of the immediate following of King Henry. Others of the princes and nobles were quartered in the market hall and lower town, but great part of thine troops were in tents, and in a state of much discomfort, owing to the overflowings of the Marne. Fighting was the least of their dangers, though their skirmishes were often fought ankle-deep in mud and mire, fever and ague were among them, and many a sick man was sent away to recover or die at Paris. The long dark evenings were a new trial to men used to summer campaigning, and nothing but Henry's wonderful personal influence and perpetual vigilance kept up discipline. At any hour of the day or night, at any place in the camp, the king might be at hand, with a cheery word of sympathy or encouragement, or with the most unflinching sternness towards any disobedience or debauchery, ever a presence to be either loved or dreaded. An engineer in advance of his time, he was persuaded that much of the discomfort might be remedied by trenching the ground around the camp, but this measure proved wonderfully distasteful to the soldiery. How hard they labored in the direct siege operations they cared not, but to be set to drain French fields seemed to them absurd and unreasonable and the work would not have proceeded at all without constant superintendence from one of the chiefs of the army, since the ordinary knights and squires were as obstinately prejudiced as were the men. Thus it was that, on a cold sleety December day, James of Scotland rode along the meadows, splashing through thin ice into muddy water, and attended by his small personal suite, excepting Sir Nigel Baird, who was gone on a special commission to Paris. Both he and Malcolm were plainly and lightly armed, and wore long blue cloaks with the St. Andrew's cross on the shoulder, steel caps without visors, and the kings merely distinguished by a thread-hike circlet of gold. They had breastplates, swords, and daggers, but they were not going to a quarter where fighting was to be expected, and bright armor was not to be exposed to rust without need. A visit of inspection to the Delvers was not a congenial occupation, for though the men-at-arms had obeyed James fairly well when he was in sole command at Drew, yet whenever he was obliged to enforce anything unpopular, the national dislike to the Scot was apt to show itself, and the whole army was at present in a depressed condition which made such manifestations the more probable. But King Henry was not half recovered from a heavy feverish cold, which he had not confessed or attended to, and he had also of late been troubled with a swelling of the neck. This morning, too, much to his inconvenience and dismay, he had missed his signet ring. The private seal on such a ring was of more importance than the autograph at that time, and it would never have left the king's hand, but no doubt, in consequence of his indisposition, his finger, always small-boned, had become thin enough to allow the signet to escape unawares, he was unwilling to publish the loss, as it might cast doubt on the papers he dispatched, and he, with his Chamberlain Fitzhugh, King James, Malcolm, Percy, and a few more, had spent half the morning in the vain search. Ending by the king sending his chamberlain, Lord Fitzhugh, to carry to Paris a seal already bearing his shield, but lacking the small private mark that authenticated it as his signet. Fitzhugh would stand over the lapidary and see this added, and bring it back. Ralph Percy had meantime been sent to bring a report of the diggers, but he was long in returning, and when Henry became uneasy, James had volunteered to go himself, and Henry had consented, not because the air was full of sleety rain or snow, but because his hands were full of letters needing to be dispatched to all quarters. The air was so thick that it was not easy to see where were the sullen group of diggers presided over by the quantum duelists of Thirsk, Kitson, and Trenton, now the most inseparable and impracticable of men, but James and his companions had ridden about two miles from the marketplace, when Ralph Percy came out of the mist, exclaiming, 
is it you, Sir King? Maybe you can do something with those rascals. I've talked myself blue with cold to make them slope the sides of their dyke, but the Alkitson says no Yorkshireman ditcher ever went but by one fashion, and none ever shall, and when I lifted my riding rod at the most insolent of the rogues, what must Trenton do but tell me the lot were free yeomen, and I'd best look out, or they'd roll me in the mire if I meddled with a soul of them. You didn't threaten to strike Trenton? No, no, the sullen cur is a gentleman. Twas one of those lubberly men at arms. I told them they should hear what King Harry would say to their mood. I would it were he. So would I, said James. Little chance that they will hearken to a Scot when you have put them in such a mood. Hold, Ralph, do not go for the king, he has letters for the emperor mattering more than this dyke. He rode on, and did his best by leaping into the ditch, taking the spade, and showing the superior security of the angle of inclination traced by the king, but all in vain, both Trenton and Kitson silently but obstinately scouted the notion that any king should know more about ditches than themselves. See, cried Percy, starting up, here's other work. The fellows, whence came they? Favored by the fog and the soft soil of the meadows, a considerable body of the enemy were stealing on the delvers with the manifest purpose of cutting them off from the camp. They were all mounted, but the only horses in the English party were those of James, Percy, Malcolm, and the half-dozen men of his escort. James, assuming the command at once, bade these to be all released, they would be sure to find their way to the camp, and that would bring succor. Meantime he drew the whole of the men, about thirty in number, into a compact body. They were, properly, archers, but their bows had been left behind, and they had only their pikes and bills, which were, however, very formidable weapons against cavalry as long as they continued in an unbroken rank, and though the bogs, pools, sunken hedges, and submerged stumps made it difficult to keep close together as they made their way slowly with one flank to the river, these obstacles were no small protection against a charge of horsemen. For a quarter of a mile these tactics kept them unharmed but at length they reached a wide smooth meadow, and the enemy seemed preparing to charge. James gave orders to close up and stand firm, pikes outwards. Malcolm's heart beat fast, it was the most real peril he had yet seen, and yet he was cheered by the king's ringing voice, stand firm, ye merry men. They must soon be with us from the camp. Suddenly a voice shouted, the Scots. The Scots. Tis the Scots. Treachery. We are betrayed. Come, sir, to Percy, they'll be on you. Treason. And it were, you fool, would a Percy turn his back, cried Ralph, striking at the man, but the panic had seized the whole body, all were shouting that the false Scots king had brought his countrymen down on them, they scattered hither and thither, and would have fallen an easy prey if they had been pursued. But this did not seem to be the purpose of the enemy, who merely extended themselves so as to form a hedge around the few who stood, sword in hand, disdaining to fly. These were, James, somewhat in advance, with his head high, and a lion look on his brow, Malcolm, white with dismay, Ralph, restless with fury, Kitson and Trenton, apparently as unmoved as ever, Brewster, equally steady, and Malcolm's follower, Halbert, in a glow of hopeful excitement. Never fear, friends, said James, kindly, to you this can only be matter of ransom. I fear nothing, sharply answered Ralph. We'll stand by you, sir, said Kitson to Ralph, but if ever there were foul treason. Shaw! You ass, were all Percy's thanks, for at that moment a horseman came forward from among the enemy, a gigantic form on a tall white horse, altogether a dark gray man the open visor revealing an elderly face, hard-featured and grim, and the shield on his arm so dinted, faded, and battered, as scarce to show the blue chief and the bleeding crowned heart, but it was no unfamiliar sight to Malcolm's eyes, and with a slight shudder he bent his head in answer to the fierce whisper, Old Douglas. Himself, with which Hotspur's son certified himself that he had the foe of his house before him. King James, resting the point of his sword on his mailed foot, stood erect and gravely expectant, 
and the Scot, springing to the ground, advanced with the words, We greet you well, my liege, and hereby he was bending his knee as he spoke, and removing his gauntlet in preparation for the act of homage. Hold, Earl Douglas, said James, homage is vain to a captive. You are captive no longer, Sir King, said Earl Archibald. We have long awaited this occasion, and will at once return to Scotland with you, with the arms and treasure we have gained here, and will bear down the craven Albany. Kitson and Trenton looked at one another and grasped their swords, as though doubting whether they ought not to cut down their king's prisoner rather than let him be rescued, and meanwhile the cry, Save King James, broke out on all sides, knights leapt down to tender their homage, and among the foremost Malcolm knew Sir Patrick Drummond, crying aloud, My lord, my lord, we have waited long for you. Be a free king in free Scotland. Trust us, my liege. Trust you, my friends, said James, deeply touched, I trust you with all my heart, but how could you trust me if I began with a breach of faith to the King of England? Ralph Percy held up his finger and nodded his head to the Yorkshire squires, who stood open-mouthed, still believing that a Scot must be false. There was an angry murmur among the Scots, but James gazed at them undauntedly, as though to look it down. Yes, to King Harry, he said, in his trumpet voice. I belong to him, and he has trusted me as never prisoner was trusted before, nor will I betray that trust. The foul fiend takes such niceties, muttered old Douglas, but, checking himself, he said, Then, sir, give me your sword, and we'll have you home as my prisoner, to save this your honor. Yeah, said James, that is mine own, though my body be yours, and till England put me to ransom you would have but a useless captive. Sir, said Sir John Swinton, pressing forward, if my lord of Douglas be plain-spoken, bethink you that it is no cause for casting aside this one hope of freedom that we have sought so long. If you have the heart to strike for Scotland, this is the time. It is not the time, said James, nor will I do Scotland the wrong of striking for her with a dishonored hand. That will we see when we have him at Hermitage Castle, quoth Douglas to his followers. Now, Sir King, best give your sword without more grimace. Living or dead you are ours. I yield not, said James. Dead you may take me alive, never. Then turning his eyes to the faces that gazed on him so earnestly in disappointment, in affection, or in scorn, he spoke, Brave friends, who may perchance love me the better that I have been a captive half my life and all my reign, you can believe how sere my heart burns for my bonny land's sake, and how little I'd wreck of my life for her weal. But broken oaths are ill beginnings. For me, so notably trusted by King Henry, to break my bonds, would shame both Scots and kings, and it were yet more paltry to feign to yield to my lord of Douglas. Rescue or no rescue, I am England's captive. Gentles, kindly brother Scots, in one way alone can you free me. Give up this wretched land of France, whose troubles are but lengthened by your valor. Let me gang to King Harry and tell him your swords are at his service, so soon as I am free. Then am I your king indeed, we return together, staunch hearts and strong hands, and the key shall keep the castle, and the bracken bush keep the cow, though I lead the life of a dog to bring it about. His tawny eye flashed with falcon light, and as he stood towering above all the tall men around, there were few who did not in heart own him indeed their king. But his picture of royal power accorded ill with the notions of a black Douglas, in the most masterful days of that family, and Earl Archibald who had come to regard kings as beings meant to be hectored by Douglases, resentfully exclaimed, Hear him, comrades, he has avouched himself a South Ron at heart. Has he reckoned how little it would cost to give a thrust to the caitiff who has lost heart in his prison, and clear the way for Albany, who is at least a true Scot? Do so, Lord Earl, said James, and end a long captivity. But let these go scatheless. With one voice, Percy, Kitson, Trenton, and Brewster shouted their resolve to defend him to the last, and Malcolm, flinging himself on Patrick Drummond, adjured him to save the king. Thou here, laddie, said Patrick, amazed, and while several more knights exclaimed, Sir, sir, we'll see no hand laid on you, he thrust forward, take my horse, sir, ride on, 
and I'll see no scathe befall you. Thanks, said James, but my feet will serve me best, we will keep together. The Scottish force seemed dividing into two, Douglas and his friends and retainers, mounted and holding together, as though still undecided whether to grapple with the king and his half-dozen companions, while Drummond and about ten more lances were disposed to guard him at all risks. Now, said James to his English friends, and therewith, sword in hand, he moved with a steady but swift stride towards the camp, nor did Douglas attempt pursuit, some of the other horsemen hovered between, and Patrick Drummond, with a puzzled face, kept near on foot. So they proceeded till they reached a bank in Willow Hedge, through which horses could hardly have pursued them. On the other side of this, James turned round and said, Thanks, Sir Knight, I suppose I may not hope that you will become a follower of the Knight Adventurer. I cannot fight under the English banner, my liege. Elsewhere I would fellow you to the death. This is no time to show your error, said James, and I therefore counsel you to come no farther. The English will be pricking forth in search of us, so I will but thank you for your loyal aid. I entreat you, sir, cried Patrick, not to believe that we meant this matter to go as it is done. It had long been our desire, of all of us, that is, save my Lord Buchan's retainers, to find you and release you, but never did we deem that Lord Douglas would have dared to conduct matters thus. You would be little the better for me did Lord Douglas bring me back on his own terms, said James, smiling. No, no, when I go home, it shall be as a free king, able to do justice to all alike, and for that I am content to bide my time, and trust to such as you to back me when it comes. And with all my heart, sir, said Patrick, would that you were where I could do so now? Ah! Laddie, to Malcolm, Yuri in good hands. My certie, I kenned ye but by your voice. Yuri verily grown into a goodly ship after all, and ye stood as brave as the rest. My poor father would have been fain to see this day. Malcolm flushed to the ears, somehow Patrick's praise was not as pleasant to him as he would have expected, and he only faltered, you know. I can but what Johnny Swinton brought me in a letter fray the abbot of Coldingham, that my father, the saints be with him, had been set on and slain by yon accursed master of Albany, would that his thrapple were in my grip, that he had sent you southwards to the king, and that your sister was in St. Abbs. Is it so? Malcolm had barely time to make a sign of affirmation, when the king hurried him on. I grieve to balk you of your family tidings, but delay will be ill for one or other of us, so fare thee well, Sir Patrick, till better times. He shook the knight's hand as he spoke, cut short his protestations, and leapt down the bank, saying in a low voice, as he stretched out his hand and helped Malcolm down after him, he would have known me again for your guest if we had stood many moments longer, he looked hard at me as it was, and neither in England nor Scotland may the journey of mine be blazed abroad. Malcolm was on the whole rather relieved, he could not help feeling guilty towards Patrick, and unless he could have full time for explanation, he preferred not falling in with him. And at the same moment Kitson stepped towards the king. Sir, you are an honest man, and we crave your pardon if we said aught that seemed in doubt thereof. James laughed, shaking each honest hand, and saying, at least, good sirs, do not always think Scott and traitor the same word, and thank you for backing me so gallantly. I'd wish no better than to back such as you, sir, said Kitson heartily, and James then turned to Ralph Percy and asked him what he thought of the Douglas face to face. A dour old block, said Ralph. If those runaways had but stayed within us, the hoary ruffian should have had his lesson from a Percy. James smiled, for the grim giant was still a good deal more than a match for the slim, rosy-faced stripling of the house of Percy, who nevertheless simply deemed his nation and family made him invincible by either Scot or Frenchman. The difficulties of their progress, however, entirely occupied them. Having diverged from the regular track, they had to make their way through the inundated meadows, sometimes among deep pools, sometimes in quagmires, or ever hedges, while the water that drenched them was fast freezing, and darkness came down on them. 
all stumbled or were bogged at different times, and Malcolm, shorter and weaker than the rest, and his lameness becoming more felt than usual, could not help impeding their progress, and at last was so spent that but for the king's strong arm he would have spent the night in a bog hole. At last the lights were near, the outskirts were gained, the password given to the watch, and the rough but welcome greeting was heard, that's well. More of you come in. How got you off? The rogues got back, then, said Kitson. Some score of them, was the answer, but tis thought most are drowned or stuck by the French. The king is in a proper rage, as well he may be, but what else could come of a false Scot in the camp? Have a care, you foul tongue. Percy was the first to cry, and as torches were now brought out and cast their light on the well-known faces, the soldiers stood abashed, but James tarried not for their excuses, his heart was hot at the words which implied that Henry suspected him, and he strode hastily on to the convent, where the quadrangle was full of horses and men, and the windows shone with lights. At the door of the refectory stood a figure whose armor flashed with light, and his voice sounded through the closed visor, I tell you, March, I cannot rest till I knew what his hap has been. If he have done this thing. What then, answered James out of the darkness, in a voice deep with wrath, but Henry started. You there. You safe. Speak again. Come here that I may see. Where is he? Here, Sir King, said James, gravely. Now the saints be thanked, cried Henry, joyously. Where be the caitiffs that brought me their false tale? They shall hang for it at once. It was the less wonder, said James, still coldly, that they should have thought themselves betrayed, since their king believed it of me. Nay, twas but for a hot moment I, and the bitterest I ever spent. What could I do when the villains swore that there were signals and I know not what devices passing? I hoped yet twas but a plea for their own cowardice, and was mounting to come and see for you. Come, I should have known you better, I'd rather the whole world deceive me than have distrusted you, Jamie. There was that in his tone which ended all resentment, and James's hand was at once clasped in his, while Henry added, Ho, Provost Marshal! To the gallows with these knaves! Nay, Harry, said James, let me plead for them. There was more than ordinary to dismay them. Dismay. Aye, the more cause they should have stood like honest men. If a rogue be not to hang for deserting his captain and then maligning him, soon would knavery be master of all. Hear me first, Hal. I'll hear when I return and you are dried. Why, man, thou art an icicle errant. Change thy garments while I go round the posts or I shall hear not for the chattering of thy teeth. Nor I for your cough, if you go, Harry. Surely, tis Salisbury's night. The more cause that I be on the alert. Could I be everywhere, mayhap a few winter blasts would not have chilled and frozen all the manhood out of the host. He spoke very sharply as he threw him on his horse, and wrapped his cloak about him, a poor defense, spite of the ermine lining, against the frost of the December night for a man whose mother, the fair and wise Mary de Bohun, had died in early youth from disease of the lungs. James and the two young partners of his adventure had long been clad in their gowns of peace, and seated by the fire in the refectory, James with his harp in his hand, from time to time dreamily calling forth a few plaintive notes, such as he said always rang in his ears after hearing a Scottish voice, when they again heard Henry's voice in hot displeasure with the provost marshal for having deferred the execution of the runaways till after the hearing of the story of the King of Scots. His commands were not to be transgressed for the king of anything, and he only reprieved the wretches till morning that their fate might be more signal. He spoke with the peremptory fierceness that had of late almost obscured his natural good humor and kindliness, and when he entered the refectory and threw himself into a chair by the fire, he looked wearied out in body and mind, shivered, and coughed, and said with unwanted depression that the sullen fellows would make a quagmire of their camp after all, since a French reinforcement had come up, 
and the vigilance that would be needed would occupy the whole army. At supper he ate little and spoke less, and when James would have related his encounter within the Scots, he cut him short, saying, Let that rest till morning, I am sick of hearing of it. An air upon thy harp would be more to the purpose. Nor would James have been unwilling to be silent on old Douglas's conduct if he had not been anxious to plead for the panic-stricken archers, as well as to extol the conduct of the two youths and of the Yorkshire squires, but, as he divined that the young Hotspur would regard praise from him as an insult, he deferred the subject for his absence, and launched into a plaintive narrative ballad, to which Henry listened, leaning back in his chair, often dozing, but without relaxation of the anxiety that sat on his pale face, and ever and anon wakening within a heavy sigh, as though his buoyant spirits were giving way under the weight of care he had brought on himself. James was just singing of one of the many nightly orphans of romance, exposed in woods to the nurture of bears, his father slain, his mother dead of grief, a ditty he had perhaps chosen for its soporific powers, when a gay bugle blast rang through the court of the convent. The French would scarce send a parley thus late, exclaimed James, but the next moment a joyful clamor arose without, and Henry, springing to his feet, spoke not, but stood awaiting the tidings with the color burning on cheek and brow in suppressed excitement. An esquire, splashed to the ears, hurried into the room, and falling on his knees, cried aloud, God save King Harry. News, news, my lord. The queen has safely borne you a fair son at Windsor Castle, five days since. Henry did not speak, but took the messenger's hand, wrung it, and left a costly ring there. Then, taking off his cap, he put his hands over his face, uttering a few words of fervent thanksgiving almost within himself, and then turning to the esquire, made further inquiries after his wife's welfare, took from him the letter that Archbishop Chichely had sent, poured out a cup of wine for him, bade the lords around make him good cheer, but craved license for himself to retire. It was so unlike his usual hilarious manner that all looked at one another in anxiety, and spoke of his unusual susceptibility to fatigue and care, while the squire, looking at the rich jewel in his hand, declared within disappointment in his tone that he would rather have had a mere flint stone so he had heard King Harry's own cheery voice. James was not the least anxious of them, but long ere like the next morning Henry stood at his bedside, saying, I must go round the posts before Mass, Janey. Will you face the matin frost? I am fitter to face it than thou, said James, rising. Is there need for this? Great need, said Henry. Here are these fresh forces all aglow within their first zeal, and unless they are worse captains than I suppose them, they will attempt some mischief ere long, nor is any time so slack as cockcrow. James was speedily ready, and, within some suppressed sighs, so was Malcolm, who knew himself in duty bound to attend his master, and was kept on the alert by seeing Ralph Percy also on foot. But it was a great relief to him that the young gentlemen murmured in no measured terms against the intolerable activity of their kings. No other attendants went within them, since Henry was wont to patrol his camp with as little demonstration as possible. I would scarcely ask a dog to come out with me this wintry morn, said he, as he waved back his sleepy chamberlain, Fitzhugh, and took his brother king's arm, but I could not but crave a turn with thee, Jamie, ere the hue and cry of rejoicing begins. That is poor welcome for your heir, said James. Poor child, said Henry, then, after they had walked some space in silence, he added, you'll mock me, but I would that this had not befallen at Windsor. I had laid my plans that it should be otherwise, but ladies are ill to guide. And wherefore should it not have been at Fair Windsor? If I can love it as a prison, sure your son may well love it as a cradle. No dishonor or to Windsor, said Henry, but, sleeping or waking, this whole night hath this adage rung in my ears. Harry, born at Monmouth, shall short time live in Algate, Harry, born at Windsor, shall long time live and lose all. A most choice piece of royal poesy and prophecy, laughed James. Nay, do not charge me with it, thou dainty minstrel. It was sung to me by my old Herefordshire nurse, when Windsor seemed as little within my reach as Moe, 
and I never thought of it again till I looked to have a son. Then bulk the prophecy, said James, Edward born at Windsor got enough, and lived long enough to boot. Too late, was the answer. The archbishop christened the poor child Harry in the very hour of his birth. Poor child, echoed James, rather sarcastically. Nay, tis not solely the rhyme, said Henry, but this has been a wakeful night, and not without misgivings whether I am one who ought to look for joy in his children. What is past was not such that you alone should cry mea culpa, said James. I never thought so till now, said Henry. Yet who knows? My father was a winsome young man ere his exile, full of tenderness to us all, at the rare times he was with us. Who knows what cares may make of me ere my boy learns to know me? You will not hold him aloof, and give him no chance of loving you? I trow not. I'll have him with me in the camp, and he and my brave men shall be one another's pride. Which Roman emperor is it that hears the nickname his father's soldiers gave him as a child? Nay, Caligula was it? Omens are against me this morning. Then laughs them to scorn, and be yourself, said James. Bless God for the goodly child, who was born to two kingdoms, one by his father's and his grandsire's swords. Ah, said Henry, depressed by failing health, a sleepless night, and hungry morning, maybe it were better for him, soul and body both, did I stand here Duke of Lancaster, and good Edmund of March yonder were head of realm and army. Never would he be head of this army, said James. He would be snoring at Shen, that is, if he could sleep for the trouble the Duke of Lancaster would be giving him. Henry laughed at last. Good King Edmund, he would assuredly never try to set the world right on its hinges. Honest fellow, soon he will be as hearty in his congratulations as though he did not lie under a great wrong. Hi ho! Such as he may be in the right aunt. I've marveled of late, whether any priest or hermit could bring back my old assurance, that all this is my work on earth, or tell me if it be all one grand error. Men there have been like Caesar, Alexander, or Charlemagne, who thought my thoughts and worked them out, and surely church and nations cry aloud for purifying. Jerusalem, and a general council, I saw them once clear and bright before me, but now a mist seems to rise up from Richard's blood, and hide them from me and there comes from it my father's voice when he asked on his deathbed what right I had to the crown. What would it be if I had to leave this work half done? He was interrupted by the sight of a young knight stealing into the camp, after a furtive expedition to Paris. It was enough to rouse him from his despondent state, and the severity of his wrath was in full proportion to the offense. Nor did he again utter his misgivings, but was full of his usual alacrity in life as though daylight had restored his buoyancy. James, on the way back to the Thanksgiving Mass, interceded for last night's offenders, as an act of grace suitable to the occasion, but Henry was inexorable. Had they stood to die like Englishmen, they had not lied like dogs. He said, and as dogs they shall hang. In fact, in the critical state of his army, he knew that the only safety lay in the promptest and sternest justice, and therefore the three foremost in accusing King James of treachery were hung long before noon. However, he called for the two Yorkshiremen, and thus addressed them, Well done, my masters. Thanks for showing Scots and Frenchmen what stuff Englishmen are made of. I keep my word, good fellows. Kneel down, and I'll dub each a knight. How now? What are you blundering and whispering for? So please you, sir, said Kitson, this is no matter to win one's spurs for mere standing still without a blow. I would all have that same gift of standing still, returned Henry. What is it sticks in your gizzard, friend? If tis the fees, I take them on myself. No, sir, hoarsely cried both. And Kitson explained, Sir, you said you'd knight the one of us that was foremost. Now, the two being dubbed, we shall be but where we were before as to Mistress Agnes of Mineshall, 
unless of your goodwill you would be pleased to let us fight out the wager of the Harriard in all peace and amity. Henry burst out laughing, with all his old merriment, as he said, for no Mistress Agnes living can I have honest men's lives wasted, especially if such as have that gift of standing still. If she does not know her own mind, one of you must get himself killed by the Frenchman, not by one another. So kneel down, and we'll make your knighthood's feast fall in with that of my son. Thus Sir Christopher Kitson and Sir William Trenton rose up knights, and bore their honours with a certain bluntness that made them butts, even while they were the heroes of the day, and Henry, who had resumed his gay temper, made much diversion out of their mingled shrewdness and gruffness. So, muttered Malcolm to Ralph Percy, we are passed over in the selfsame matter for which these fellows are knighted. Tush, answered Percy, I'd scorn to be confounded with a couple of clowns like them. Moreover, he added, with better reason, their valor was more exercised than ours, inasmuch as they thought there was treachery, and we did not. No, no, when my spurs are won, it shall be for some prowess, better than standing stock still. Malcolm held his tongue, unwilling that Percy should see that he did feel this an achievement, but he was vexed at the lack of reward, fancying that knighthood would be no small step in the favor of that imaginary esclairement whom he had made for himself. Light of the world he loved to call her still, but it was in the commonplace romance of his time, the mere light of beauty and grace illuminating the world of chivalry.